Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this course, NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction and in this particular lecture we will start with what is the first text in this course which is Rabindranath Tagore's short story, The Postmaster. Uh, so we will start with this text but it is important as always to give a background uh, to the cultural conditions that we will see in this text. Uh, so this is obviously written in the time of uh, this is colonial Bengal, Bengal under the British rule and the post office becomes a very symbolic space uh, in this particular story and a postmaster of course is a professional but you know we will see how the professional persona uh, and the personal persona, the existential persona are you know dialoguing with each other in this particular story. So the backdrop is colonial uh, Bengal and, and the post office and the postmaster are obviously uh, symbolic uh, functions of that colonial machinery. But inside this colonial machinery, we find a very human sto short story, a very human tale, a very human experience uh, which is captured in this particular story. Uh, there is also the uh, very symbolic presence of the indigo plantation, the indigo factory which is again a very, very colonial machinery uh, because the entire idea of the indigo was to uh, produce a certain crop, a certain, uh, a certain product, a certain commodity which is quite colonial in quality and that indigo would obviously be transported away uh, to the uh, industries uh, in England. So the post office and the indigo plantation are very, very interestingly a uh, place apropos of one another in this massive colonial machinery that we see in the story. And the postmaster becomes a very symbolic uh, presence in this uh, in the story. As I mentioned, uh, he's a colonial servant, he's a, a servant, uh, a, a function, a functionary uh, inside the colonial machinery. But equally, uh, this is a story about uh, memory, this is a story about human emotions, this is a story about uh, gender because we do find a very interesting relationship which grows, which brews between the postmaster, uh, this young man and it's very, very uh, small girl who, who does his odd jobs for him, uh, Ratan in this particular story. And Ratan is obviously a village girl, a rural girl, uh, illiterate and uh, she is taught by the postmaster and they begin to uh, form a human bond which is very tragically truncated at the end of the story. So there are lots of issues we will touch upon as we move on but you know, these are some of the uh, general broad brushed uh, themes that we will uh, keep coming back to the colonial machinery, uh, the postmaster as a white collar uh, servant in the colonial machinery and it's very interesting gender perspective that we see in this particular story and also the symbolic sites, the post office and the indigo plantation, the indigo factory that we see in the story. And the other thing that we will touch upon a little bit is the uh, relationship or the uh, contrast that is shown uh, in between the city and the country because we are told that the postmaster is a Calcutta person, is a person in the, in the colonial capital Calcutta. And he obviously has a, an urban background, he has an urban uh, mind, he has an urban uh, set of habits which are completely non-synchronous uh, or you know, incongruous with the rural setting uh, in which the story is, uh, you know, is described which is that of Ulapur, the village of called Ulapur which is where the story takes place. So let's dive into the story and see what takes place in this short story uh, called The Postmaster by Rabindranath Tagore which we obviously reading in translation. So the postmaster, this should be on the screen now, the postmaster first took up his duties in the village of Ulapur. Though the village was a small one, there was an indigo factory nearby and a proprietor, an Englishman had managed to get a post office established. So we see immediately how uh, the colonial presence, the colonial condition, the colonial culture is established in, in a very inception of the story that we are told is the village called Ulapur and although the village was a small one, there was an indigo factory and the indigo factory becomes a very symbolic site of colonial control of colonial production, you know, industrial, uh, colonial industrial production. And of course, with the colonial production, uh, there needs to be uh, this entire administrative network around it, the bureaucratic network around it, the information network around it. And a post office at that time, this is obviously pre-email, pre-anything that we know today as technology. Uh, the post office over here becomes uh, the very symbolic site through which the colonial control is uh, exerted and, and, and consolidated because the post office becomes the site of information exchange. So we, when, on one hand we have the indigo factory as a site of production and the post office over here as a site of dissemination, right? So dissemination of information uh, regarding related to presumably 
uh, the production uh, politics, the, the production control, the production reports of this particular Indigo factory, right? And we are also told immediately that the proprietor happens to be an Englishman who is obviously a colonial person in control of this Indigo factory, you know, he, he owns the Indigo factory. Okay. Our postmaster belonged to Calcutta and as is mentioned, this is also a story about the tension or the contradiction in culture and mindset between uh, a city mine and, an, and a rural mind and we have shown the binary in very interesting terms. He felt like a fish out of water in his remote village. His office and living room were in the dark thatched shed, not far from a green slimy pond surrounded by an old sites by a dense growth. So we have a very, very thick rural setting over here. Uh, uh, we are told that his office and his living room are part of a dark thatched shed and there is a pond nearby and there is a dense forest around the pond and the office which is obviously very different presumably uh, from the kind of conditions that he is uh, habituated to, he is used to in Calcutta. So we are told he felt like a fish out of water which is to say he felt completely um, you know, out of his comfort zone, he felt very very um, like a misfit in this particular setting. The men employed in the Indigo factory had no leisure. Moreover, they were hardly co desirable companions for decent folk. So the the laborers in Indigo Factory, we are made to told that you know we, we are told that they had no leisure, which is to say that they were you know, obviously overwrought. And one of the things which you find in this particular story, written by Tagore, is is that very characteristically uh, he he gives a lot of hints, a lot of suggestions in terms of uh, you know what is really going on without spelling it out. So we get a sense of how uh, the the Indigo Factory over here is essentially a site of exploitation. It's essentially a site of um, you know unregulated uh, production, unregulated labor, and they had no leisure. The laborers had no leisure whatsoever, and this is complete exploitation, complete unregulated exploitation, unregulated production, unregulated control of work, as we are told. So the men employed had uh, in the factory had no leisure, moreover they were hardly desirable companions for decent folk, right? So the whole idea of the decent folk or uh, the Bengali term for that is bother lok, uh, which is the, uh, the gentleman, the, 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 the genteel person who is educated presumably has had English education, uh, etc. So we, you know, those of us who are interested in the history of colonial education would know that you know, the entire idea of educating the Indians, especially in the presidency towns like Bombay, Calcutta and Madras was uh, intended to create this generation of Indians who would be a very, very handy and convenient uh, go-between, uh, you know, between the colonial you know, machinery and the colonized uh, natives. For someone, uh, people who know English, people who know a uh, basic model of education, uh, according to the Western education uh, you know, template, in order to carry out the machinery of colonialism uh, more effectively, right? So, and obviously the inception of that particular uh, enterprise began to happen, uh, had its point of uh, origin from the Macaulay Minutes of Education 1835. As some of you would know, that entire Minutes of Education by uh, Lord Macaulay uh, in the British Parliament in 1835 was to propose a bill uh, wherein you know, edu Indians would be educated, Indians would be given Western education, English education, primarily uh, to produce a generation of people, a generation of Indians uh, who would be uh, Indians in color, uh, according to Macaulay, but British in taste and temperament and education. And there would be a very, very handy buffer uh, so, so to say, between the, the, the colonial machinery, the, the colonial master and uh, the colonial servant, the colonial subject. So the, the English, the, the Bengali person over here, the bother uh, decent gentleman over here, uh, he happens to be a very direct product, a very direct progeny of that enterprise, that exercise, that experiment uh, of um, McCullough education, McCullough minutes in Indian education. So he gets a job uh, as a postmaster in a, in a British post office, uh, set in India of course. But the entire purpose of the post office, we are told, uh, is to be um, you know, the information centre, the information uh, point around the, uh, the Indigo factory. So we see, as I mentioned already, how the Indigo factory and the post office are all very colonial positions, very colonial sites. And the, uh, the man over here, uh, who has just joined the job as a postmaster, is very much part of the uh, payroll of the uh, colonial uh, machinery. Okay, so we are told that the indigo factory workers are no leisure and they are not really the decent folk, they are not really the bother logs or the gentlemen uh, with whom the, the Calcutta person would have a you know, normal uh, cultured cultivated conversation. Nor is the Calcutta boy an adept in the art of associating with others. Among strangers he appears either proud or ill at ease. At any rate, the postmaster had but little company, nor had he much to do. So he was stationed, he was positioned in a place which is uh, 
very far away from anything he knows. He doesn't have any company, he doesn't have any society. And we are told he gets more and more alienated. So we have a sense of the alienation of the uh, worker over here. And it's very interestingly um, comparable to the uh, fact that Indigo factory workers had no leisure at all. So there too there's a degree of alienation in more Marxist terms. And over here we have an alienation in the sense of more uh, existential terms. Okay, So that, that the two kinds of alienation are interesting in dialoguing with each other over here. At times he tried his hand at writing a verse or two, that the movement of the leaves and the clouds of the sky were enough to fill life with joy, such were the sentiments to which he sought to give expression. But God knows that a poor fellow would have felt it as a gift of, of a new life if some genie of the Arabian Nights had in one night swept away all the trees, the leaves and all, and replaced them with Magnetgeist Road, hiding the clouds in view with rows of tall houses. So we have a sense of uh, in a very tongue-in-cheek humor uh, that to go very characteristically depicts in all this other short fiction uh, coming out here as well. So we see that the postmaster, because he had a lot of time in his hand, he had almost nothing to do, he had no society to converse with, uh, so he tried his hand in writing verse. Uh, again, you know, this is something that, you know, is told that, you know, he would do as a man of culture and a man of cultivation. And then we are told that what were the themes that he wanted to write on and uh, the themes were obviously nature. Uh, and the movement of the leaves and the clouds of the sky and you know uh, those things filling his life with joy. Such were the sentiments to which he sought to give expression. So he wanted to give expression to those sentiments, you know, looking around him, you can just see, see trees and breeze and sky. But we are told immediately after that, actually, in his own heart, uh, he hated this place. You know, he would have been very, very happy if uh, the, all the trees and leaves were taken away by some genie of Arabian Nights. And this illusion, this reference is very interesting because the genie of Arabian Nights, as we are told, is the archetypal uh, desire machine. So he's someone who can get your job done, whatever you desire, whatever you wish for, uh, he can make that happen, he can materialize it. And that's an interesting uh, presence in this particular short story because we are told that he's very, very unhappy uh, in his job, he's very unhappy as a, a, a person in the British payroll working in a very, very alienated and lonely post office in the middle of this place called Lapu. Uh, and he's trying to write poetry, he's trying to write short fiction. Uh, based on his experiences with nature, but then in his heart, he hates everything and he longs for things such as uh, Macambadai's road, which is to say, you know, roads which are built with proper cement, roads which are built with proper tar, etc., or Pakka road, as the British would say it, uh, and then rows of tall houses. So he's more uh, keen, is more uh, habituated, is more uh, attuned or aligned to seeing Pakka houses, Macambadai's roads, roads, and tall houses. Uh, rather than seeing trees and nature and rivers and, and, and skies around him. So although he wanted to write about those things, about natural settings, about the beauty of nature, he couldn't get around to doing it because in his heart he never really related to it, right? He related only to more urban settings. So we have this town versus uh, uh, or, or village, or country versus city tension creeping in already in the story because we are told this is a person who is very much a city person and he can he feels completely out of place fish out of water we are told when he's stationed uh, almost tragically in his post office in the middle of this place called Ulapo which is a village in the middle of nowhere and doesn't have any company doesn't have any society doesn't have any um, recreation or any work for the matter right and he tries his hand in writing poetry uh, seeking to draw inspiration from the natural beauty around him but in his heart he's completely cut off from any understanding of nature and he's longing to see macrimodise roads and tall buildings instead of uh, leaves and clouds and, and skies for the matter. Okay, so um, the postmaster's salary was small. He had to cook his own meals which he used to share with Ratan, an orphan girl of the village who did all jobs for him. So we're told, we introduced uh, to the character called Ratan, uh, who we're told is an orphan girl of the village who would just do this errand jobs for him. Uh, you know, and the postmaster's salary was not very, uh, nothing to write home about, it was a very modest salary and he had to cook his own meals uh, because he couldn't hire a person who could cook his meals for him. Uh, and then he would share the meals with a girl called Ratan, who was an orphan girl of the village, who did all jobs with him. Now from, uh, from, for him. So from this point in time in the story, we, we have this relationship in the postmaster and Ratan uh, described to us in, in very, very aesthetic terms and we are told how they almost, uh, I mean, there's this very interesting parental relationship that they manage to construct. So on the one hand, the postmaster becomes a sort of a father figure for Ratan. And then we also told that in the course of the story, when, when the postmaster falls sick, Ratan heals him back 
uh, to health. And so she becomes the mother figure at that point in time. So this entire uh, politics and performance of parenting is very interestingly, uh, very complexly uh, depicted and described in this particular section. And they sort of parent each other in very, very complex ways and very existentially enriching ways. Right? And, and therein lies the bond that is shared in the course of the story. When in the evening the smoke began to curl up from the village cow sheds and uh, this, the sassadas chirped in every bush when the mendicants of the bowel sect sang their shrill songs in a daily meeting place when any poet who had attempted to watch the movement of the leaves in a dense bamboo thickets would have felt a coarser shiver run down his back. The postmaster would light this little lamp and call out Ratham. Now if you take, take a look at the descriptions over here. Uh, Sisadas chirping in every bush, bowel songs sang in uh, daily meeting places, bowel songs are the rural folk songs which are sung in rural Bengal. Uh, they can be religious in quality, uh, but they also carry a lot of um, you know, community message. So the bowel songs uh, tell a lot about the community, uh, about the conditions of life, about the conditions of dailiness, uh, which is sometimes uh, couched with religious metaphors or mystic metaphors. Uh, but bowel songs are very, very, uh, the very symbolic of rural Bengal. So that that particular symbolic presence is there uh, to describe the ruralness of this particular setting. And we also told that you know, any poet who attempted to watch the movement of the leaves in the dense bamboo thickets would feel a shiver uh, run down his back. So there's something almost uh, ghostly about how lonely this place is, how alienated this place is, and the coziness is something which is described in rural terms. And when this particular twilight moment happens every day, when the uh, birds come back uh, and smoke begins to curl from the village cow sheds, which is say that you know it's probably uh, you know people are cooking the evening meals or maybe they're burning dung, and there are bowel songs which are sung at the end of the day. And you know when any poet, presumably an urban poet, wants to write about nature, will actually feel a shiver run down his spine. Uh, you know, looking at the, uh, you know, or hearing the, the rustle of the leaves and dense bamboo thickets. At this time every day the postmaster would light his little lamp during twilight and call out Ratan. Ratan would sit outside waiting for the call and instead of coming in at once would reply, did you call me sir? What are you doing? The postmaster would ask. I must be going to light the kitchen fire. So, you know, the kitchen fire over here is the earthenware oven which would be, you know, you, used uh, with coal. So the whole point was to put the coal on fire which would create this temperature inside the earthenware oven uh, on which you can cook your meals. Right? So this is again a very, very typical object in rural Bengal, the earthenware oven. Uh, and Rotten's job would be to set fire to the coals uh, in order to warm up or heat up the earthenware oven uh, which would be used in turn to cook meals for the postmaster. So, um, I must be going to light the kitchen fire would be the answer and the postmaster would say, oh let the kitchen fire be for a while, light me my pipe first. So the pipe would be a cigarette, so you know, not exactly cigarette in the British sense, but tobacco uh, rolled into you know, a, you know, a leaf like thing, which is again something which uh, you know, uh, the, the, the rural people would, would smoke. But the pipe could also be a metaphor of urbanity over here, so we're not quite sure what pipe has been talked about. It could be an uh, urban metaphor, an urban signifier, the pipe smoked by the city people. Uh, we're not entirely sure because we also told the postmaster's salary was very modest, so you know, affording a pipe, the pipe is a, normally a signifier of the colonial masculinity, as someone who is obviously positioned uh, in, uh, you know, in the position of prestige, in a side of prestige, in a side of privilege. But we're not quite sure. But the point is, the postmaster over here, uh, he would more often than not ask Rutten to, you know, light up the, the, the pipe uh, instead of the kitchen fire, which is to say he's not really keen on his meals. Uh, it's not really related or connected to his meals uh, because there's no sense of home that he has uh, in this particular setting. So, you know, he would just while away his time smoking his pipe. So this particular preference is important. The preference for the pipe rather than the kitchen fire would know, would, would indicate that the, the, smoke, the, the, the postmaster over here as more, looks at this place uh, as more of a uh, place of leisure, uh, a place of inaction, a place where he has a kill time rather than a place of nourishment. Uh, because the entire idea, the entire metaphor of the kitchen fire uh, can be seen as a symbol of nourishment, a symbol of homely, intimate nourishment, which he doesn't want. Uh, rather, he wants to light the pipe and smoke the pipe, and that's what he instructs Rotten to do. 
At last, Rotten would enter, uh, would enter, and puffed up with puffed up cheeks, vigorously blowing into a flame a live coal to light the tobacco. This would give the postmaster. Uh, an opportunity of conversing. So, you know, the whole idea of the opportunity of conversing is in, important because uh, we are told at the beginning of the story that we, he doesn't really get a chance to converse with people on his own equal wavelength because he can't converse with the uh, factory workers and obviously can't converse with the um, British proprietor of the factory. So, he's completely alone. So, he ends up talking to this girl called Ratan who does, did uh, all jobs for him. Well, Ratan, perhaps you'll begin. Do you remember anything of your mother? That was a fertile subject. Ratan partly remembered and partly did not. Her father had been fonder of her than her mother, him she recollected more vividly. He used to come home in the evening after his work, and one or two evenings stood out more clearly than others. Like pictures in a memory, Ratan would sit on the floor near the postmaster's feet as memories crowded in upon her. So the whole idea of memory coming back, uh, this is a very, almost a Wordsworthian kind of a setting where there are two people, two human subjects uh, who otherwise are not occupied with anything. They recollect emotions and tranquility. Uh, and then the question about his father or a mother would remind Ratan of the many memories he, she had with the father. And she would narrate those uh, uh, to the postmaster and that's the way they would pass time every evening. So Ratan would sit on the floor near the postmaster's feet as memories crowded in upon her. As she called to mind a little brother that she had and on some bygone cloudy day she had played at fishing with him on the edge of the pond with a twig for a make-believe fishing rod. So again, the whole idea of a make-believe game with a brother we don't know what's wrong with him. Maybe, you know, at this point we can't guess, but you know, there's a very strong hint, a very strong suggestion. Maybe they're all dead. Uh, maybe they died of poverty. Maybe they died of a disease. And maybe they died by not being, you know, nourished enough. We don't know. But she recollects these events in a very, very uh, flashback kind of way, in a very flashy way. Some images come back to her uh, with some flashy uh, vigor, and she narrates those uh, to the purest master as and when those come back. <clears throat> Such little incidents would drive out greater events from her mind. Um, you know, thus, as they talked, it would often get very late, and the purse master would feel too lazy to do any cooking at all. Rotten would then hastily light the fire to toast some unleavened bread, which, with the cool remnants on the morning meal, was enough for their supper. So this is what I meant earlier when I said that the postmaster doesn't really feel connected to this place as a home, so he doesn't really uh, think of cooking a meal, uh, which would be symbolic of a home, a homely meal. But rather he's more keen on passing time with a conversation. So he smokes his tobacco, he smokes his pipe, and listens to Ratan talking about her uh, father and her family. And in the end, when it'll get very, very late, he'll just make some bread. Some unleavened bread, we're told, which they'll have for supper, uh, with the cold remnants of a morning meal. So. There is a degree of staleness about this existence that we can see with the reputation of the food. It's not really fresh food, it's not really warm food. The lack of warmth, the lack of freshness is something that we see quite palpably present in this particular uh, setting. On some evenings, seated at the desk in the corner of his big empty shed, the Pierce master too would call up memories of his own home, of his mother and his sister, of those to, for whom in his exile his heart was sad. Memories which were always haunting him, but which he could not talk about when the men of the, with the men of the factory, though he found himself naturally recalling them aloud in the presence of a simple little girl. So interestingly, we find that the Pierce master connects much better, much more organically uh, to the little girl Ratan over here than to the man of the factory. Uh, so there's a degree of cultural gap over here, presumably, that he cannot recollect, he cannot narrate, he cannot share his recollections with the men of the factory, although they're men, uh, so there's gender affinity that he presumably has to them, but there's this wavelength mismatch which causes him not to confide to them. But, on the other hand, talk to the little girl uh, in terms of telling her about his memories, uh, you know, memories of his home, his mother and his sister. Um, okay. So, and so it came about that a girl would allude to his people as mother, brother and sister as if she had known them all her life. In fact, she had a complete picture of each one of them painted in a little heart. So this is very, very interesting uh, how kinship is established through memory or how kinship is established through you know, recollection of memory. So the postmaster would recollect memories or narrate memories of his uh, mother, sister uh, and presumably other members of the family uh, to uh, the little girl and also his brother. And he would tell more and more stories every single day to the point, till the point came that a little girl, Ratan, uh, imagined herself to be part of the family. So we can see again, so I remember and say, kinship is established, generated through storytelling uh, in, this particular, in, in this particular section. 
storytelling or consuming stories makes you akin uh, to the characters in the story, it makes you uh, somehow related organically, existentially, emotionally with the characters in the story, right? So this is a very, very interesting uh, little uh, image that Tagore is creating over here. And if you visualize it, a uh, little girl listening to stories told by an older man uh, who's very lonely, very sad, and he's telling her stories about his family, his relatives, his brother, his sister, his mother, and she's consuming all the stories with great delight to the point that he, she finds herself planted in that particular setting. She finds herself situated in that particular setting as part of the family of the prose master. It's a very, very organic kind of a consumption of stories, or organic consumption of memory, uh, so to say. One noon, during a break in the rains, there was a cool soft breeze blowing. The smell of the damp grass and leaves in the hot sun felt like the warm breathing of the tired earth on one's body. A persistent bird went on all the afternoon, repeating the burden of its own complaint in nature's audience chamber. So again, the, the natural descriptions are very, very evocative in quality. We are told that there's this cool breeze which is coming after a rain and the sound of a bird which is calling all the afternoon, repeating the burden of its own complaint in nature's audience chamber. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of dialoguing description over here. The little bird talking to the nature, the rain falling on earth, uh, all very dialoguing entanglement, very organic entanglement between or across different natural signifiers. The purest master had nothing to do. Uh, the shimmer of the freshly washed leaves, uh, the banked up remnants of the retreating rain clouds were sights to see. And the purest master was watching them and thinking to himself, oh, if only some kindred soul were near, just one loving human being whom I can hold near my heart. This was exactly, he went on to think, what the bird was trying to say. And it was the same, same feeling that, which the murmuring leaves were trying to express was striving to express. So look at the way in which he establishes a dialogue with the natural uh, objects around him, the bird. So he's sort of guessing that a bird is probably trying to tell about loneliness, is probably trying to listen uh, and or, or sing about loneliness and alienation. The same with the leaves. Uh, maybe the murmuring leaves were trying to express, uh, you know, that in, if only this wish of having a companion to talk to, a human companion that would be an interlocutor uh, of his experience, of his memories, right? So that kind of a wish for an interlocutor, that for uh, that wish for uh, someone to listen to uh, you know, his particular story is something which the postmaster is projecting uh, onto the natural elements around him. So this is a very classic case of projection of loneliness, a projection of a wish fulfillment. And he's sort of thinking that a little bird uh, chirping away uh, to nature is probably talking about his loneliness and the, uh, the, the rustling leaves talking the rain on the earth are probably also talking about his loneliness. So it's all getting projected in a very, very organic, natural kind of way. But no one knows or would believe that such an idea might also have, might also take possession of an ill-paid village postmaster in the deep, silent, midday interval of his work. The postmaster sighed and called a rutten. Uh, Ruthen was in sprawling beneath the guava tree, busily engaged with, in eating unripe guava. So again, a very, very brutal in the fire. Uh, someone sitting under guava trees and, and eating unripe guavas. Uh, the unripe thing is interesting over here because that's uh, it's, it's sort of it's more rural in quality. Whereas a ripe guava, which is more consumerist, which is bought in the market, it's more uh, you know commonly urban in quality, right? So this image of this girl sitting behind or sitting beneath a uh, guava tree eating unripe guavas is a very brutal image, a very idyllic brutal image, so to say. So Ratham was in sprawling beneath the guava tree, busily engaged in eating unripe guavas. At the voice of the, her master, she ran up breathlessly, saying, What are you calling me, Dada? I was thinking, said the post master, of teaching you to read. And then for the rest of the afternoon, he taught her the alphabet. So again, notice the transition uh, between from Sir to Dada. Right? Dada is elder brother in Bengali. So, you know, that address of Dada or elder brother to the postmaster, it suggests a sense of intimacy existential emotional intimacy that she's beginning to brew with the Pierce Master and that's something that she's addressing him with. And then, uh, you know, she's told that the Postmaster wishes to teach them how to read. So, you know, they'll start with the alphabets. Thus, in a very short time, Ratan had got as far as a double consonant. So, she could read compound consonants, so double consonants. So, she was progressing and obviously she was very quick with it. She was a very clever and keen student of the Pierce Master. It seemed as though the showers of the season would never end. Uh, canals, ditches and hollows were all overflowing with water. So there's abundant, overabundance of, of rainfall, which is creating trouble uh, for everyone over here yeah, because everything was getting flooded, everything was getting spilled over with water. Day and night, the patter of rain was heard and the croaking of frogs. The village roads became impassable and marketing had to be done in puns. So, you know, the whole idea of going out to shop something uh, was almost unthinkable. So it had to be done in, in 
different phases whenever there was, uh, you know, the village roads were uh, traversable or passable because most of the time they were impassable because of the rain. One heavily clouded morning, the postmaster's little pupil had been long waiting outside the door for her car, but on not hearing it as usual, she took up a dog-eared book and slowly entered the room. So we told her Rothman would sit outside the room every single morning, waiting to be called in and then waiting to be taught by the postmaster. But at that particular morning, she wasn't being called. So she was sitting outside very patiently. Uh, but then when the call never came, she walked in uh, and slowly entered the room. She found a master stretched out on his bed and thinking that he was resting, she was about to retire on tiptoe when she suddenly heard her name. Ratham, she turned at once and asked, Where are you sleeping, Dada? The postmaster in a plaintive voice said, I'm not well. Uh, feel my head. Is it very hot? So this is a fever in the story, which becomes a very symbolic condition uh, because we find that entire idea of fever uh, where the postmaster becomes sick and unwell. It reverses the parental politics in the story because Rutten then becomes a caregiver. Rutten becomes from this point the mother figure in the story as opposed to how the postmaster had been parenting her uh, through education, right? So on the one hand, we have parenting through education. On the other hand, we have parenting through caregiving, right? So and both become very interestingly prominent in this, in this short story. So the postmaster is coming down with a fever and is asking Rotten to check his temperature by just uh, feeling it, by just touching his forehead. In the loneliness of his exile and in the gloom of the rains, his ailing body needed a little tender nursing. So it longed for human contact, for human compassion. He longed to remember the touch of the forehead of soft hands with tinkling bracelets, to, ex to imagine the presence of loving womanhood the nearness of her mother and sister. So he's rem remembering uh, the, the tinkling bracelets on uh, the hands of the mother and sister who touched him on the forehead when he was unwell. So those fond memories, those tactile memories keep coming back over here and he's longing uh, uh, to, to enjoy or to have the presence of loving womanhood, nurturing womanhood, right? So caregiving womanhood. Uh, the nearness of mother and sister. An exile was not disappointed. Rotten ceased to be a little girl. She at once stepped into the post of mother, called in the village doctor, gave the patient his pills at the proper intervals, sat up all night by his pillows, cooked the, cooked the grill for him, and every now and then asked, are you feeling a little better now, Dada? So look at the caregiving that Rotten does away. Uh, so, you know, she's called the village doctor, the village doctor comes in, so she's a good, she's also a very good presence of mind. Uh, cooked his grill for him, this food, the sick food, the uh, comfort food uh, for him. And every now and then would ask him, are you feeling a little better now, Dada? Again, big brother. It was some time before the purest master with weakened body was able to leave his sick bed. No more of this, said he with derision, with, with decision, sorry. I must get a transfer. He at once wrote off to Calcutta an application for a transfer on the grounds of the unhealthiness of the place. So we'll stop at this point today because there's a change in direction in the story, the change in argument and sentiment in the story from this point. But the, uh, what we've done so far, we can see very clearly that the fever comes in and it completely uh, decimates the postmaster health-wise, but also demoralizes them and it almost makes them uh, determined to leave this place because he decides they cannot carry on uh, you know, staying in this place which is so uh, non-conducive to his health, non-conducive to his social conditions or his uh, you know, social status or intellectual status or whatever it is. So he applies for a leave, he applies for a transfer on the grounds of the unhealthiness of the place. He writes a letter to the uh, Calcutta you know, the headquarters presumably asking or requesting a transfer. So you can look at the way in which the entire colonial machinery, especially as administrative machinery, is controlled and distributed and disseminated to the post office over here, which becomes a very important side of exchange uh, in the colonial system. And we find from this point of the story there will be a change in um, human emotions as well. There's an existential shift which will come in at this point, which will capture and, and carry on uh, in the next lectures to come. Thank you very much for your attention.